Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, study the Bible and to study your word and uh, also to share what you are doing in Lund. And I just pray that you will bless this um, presentation, that uh, your name will be lifted up and that uh, we may be inspired about uh, church planting and the, the work that you've called us to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, so just a little introduction to myself. This is where Lund is, in case you don't know. Uh, you have, of course, uh, Denmark over here. And you go across the bridge, you come to Malmö. And uh, Lund is just uh, north of, northeast of Malmö. And um, <clears throat> this is the team that is part of the team that are planting the church it's not the only people that are in that come to the services we are about 15 or something right right now that are coming to the services but these are the yeah the leaders the the core of it yeah it's basically three families no four families one two three four okay. yeah it's Don Milares and Andrea and this is Teixeiras and this is Daniel and Antonella. Teixeira. Teixeira. Yeah, he's Portuguese, so <laughs> that's the name. Anyway, uh, Lund is a student city. 40,000 students come there every year. 123,000 inhabitants in total. 22% are immigrants. So this is the, the challenge that we have. Now... <clears throat> The Bible says, of course, that the end will come when, uh, when uh, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Now, we can say, well, Sweden is reached. That's good because uh, we have at least one church in Sweden. But that's not really, I think, what, what it means. Everyone needs to hear about the gospel. And, that is, and, and somehow somebody needs to tell the people in Lund. Somebody needs to tell the people in, in all these different cities. There are so many cities in Sweden, in Scandinavia, I guess, in general, where people have not heard. Like, there's not even an Adventist church. There's, no, there's, there's hardly a Christian church, maybe. Now, of course, as Adventists, we, we believe Revelation 14.6 says that it's the everlasting gospel is to be preached to, the, to all of those who dwell on the earth and that of course includes not only um, the the general Christian um, gospel I don't like to call it that but uh, you know it is not just that people need to hear about who Jesus is um, but also the whole word uh, what what the Bible actually says what Jesus plan for their lives is and especially in this end time what, uh, what what's the role that or what are the um, what's the message that Jesus wants to communicate to the people in today's world? And those are what we call the three angels' messages. And um, this is the challenge. <clears throat> because if we look at the Christian world in general, there are very few of them that actually preach the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages, if we look, study Revelation 14, we see that those are the last three messages that are to go to the whole world and then Jesus will return in verse 14. So this is the very last message. It is a gospel-centered message. It is a Christ-centered message. Uh, but it is also a prophetic message. And this prophetic message is um, not uh, communicated by the, the, uh, the majority of the Christian churches. To my knowledge, it is basically one organization that is doing that. That doesn't mean that organization is perfect. But these are... Um, these are the ones that are called for this. And um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of course, is doing well. We have, um, it's one of the fastest growing Protestant churches in the, the world. 20.7 million, this is from 2017. Um, we have a presence in 213 countries out of 235. This is really amazing. A thousand languages. There are 1.3 million new members every year. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? it, it it's really powerful. 
158,000 churches or companies exist. We have 20,000 ordained ministers, 8,000 schools, 100, uh, almost 200 hospitals. We have ADRA in 130 plus countries. So if we look at the Adventist organization, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing organization in many ways. And we might say, well, yeah, Jesus is coming soon. However, when we compare that with some other world statistics, we realize that there are 7 billion people in the world. There's 130 million births per year. Now, if you compare that with 1.5 million new members per year, and there's 130 million births per year, you will realize that we're not really making progress so much as we hope. If Jesus is going to come and the whole world is going to hear about the third angel's message, okay, sure, we, there might be more than 1.3 million people that hear about it, but still, it is, we have a lot of work to do. Is that right? Now, there are 5 billion non-Christians. 1 plus billion are nominal Christians. Uh, yeah, they claim to be Christians, but they have no devotional life. They have no no connection with Christ. So Christ gave us the commission to go to all the world and preach the gospel. And when we look at this task, it might feel very daunting. We might feel like, whoa, how is this ever going to happen? Um, but if we look at the early church, we can actually see that they managed to do it in their generation. And how did they do that? Well, um, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So that's what we're praying for, praying for laborers. But we're praying that the laborers will be sent out. Now, the word sent out, in Greek, it is the word ekbalo. Ek means out. Balo means to throw. So this is the same word that is used when, you know, Jesus is casting out demons or uh, other, other uh, things like this, when you actually throw something. Um, so when it's saying send, you know, it sounds like formal, some, some kind of sending. But this is actually thrown headlong into service. They're thrown out there, thrown out of the comfort zone. They're, they're, they're spread out into the harvest fields. That's what we should pray for. It's, it's not, an, you know, Jesus said, go into all the world. He didn't say sit and wait until people come and ask you. This is an active um, commission. And of course, the early church, they really took this seriously. If you look, if you study Acts, we don't have time to go into all of this right now. But in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, there was a great persecution that was spread and all except the apostles, uh, they went out to preach, or they went out to different nations. And then it says in verse 4 that all of those who had been sent out, they actually started to uh, preach the gospel. So all of them, every member was involved in, in this mission. And if we study Paul's travels, we see he was going places. If you study the history of all these apostles, they didn't just stay in one place. They went out. They went to India. They went to Africa. They went to Britain. They went all over the, the whole Roman Empire and beyond the Roman Empire. Some people even, even think that it, it reached all the way to China. And that is actually, in Acts chapter 17, uh, the Christians are blamed for this. It says that these who have turned the world upside down have now ha have come here too. They really turned the world upside down. They transformed the world. And how did they do that? First uh, Colossians, we can look at that one. In just one generation. <clears throat> uh, maybe someone can read that. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. Colossians 1. Mm -hmm. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which, have, which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, hmm. whereof I fall and 
maids and minister. Thank you. So the gospel was preached to who? To, to where? To every creature under heaven. So th this, is, this is quite something. Um, the whole world heard the gospel in one generation. Romans 10, 18 says their voices has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the earth. Um, in one generation, I know it says to every nation was the gospel carried in, one, in a single generation. How did they do that? What was the secret? Um, well, the secret was, of course, the laity was involved in this. And they had a clear understanding about what the pastor's role was, which we'll study a little bit here. The same thing is true for our days. Ellen White speaks of the latter reign, and she says, This will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. It is, if we're waiting for Jesus to... Um, to return. You know, many, many Adventists, they wait, they wait for the latter rain that's going to be poured out. And we're waiting and waiting and wondering, why doesn't God do that? Maybe we pray for it. We ask God to send the latter rain. But uh, Ellen White is very clear on this. God will recognize, uh, when we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of God, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. That's the latter rain. But she says, it will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. Every member, uh, well, it doesn't say all members maybe, will be doing it. But at least the largest portion, that's at least 51% or something like that, uh, that needs to be involved in active missionary service if we are to expect the latter rain to fall. So, you can think about it, we've probably seen this super evangelist versus discipleship method. If we have a super evangelist that reaches 1,000 souls per day, um, that's a quite a good, a good evangelist, right? If we have one, uh, they reach 1,000 souls every day. So in one year, they have reached 365,000 souls. Baptized 365,000 souls. That's that's what we need. When many people look at the pastor as, yeah, this is what, we're going, what we really need. Some super pastor that goes out there and does the work and, and finishes it. Um, then we have another method called the discipleship method, where you take one person and you win one soul per year. Now, that's maybe nothing compared to the super evangelist. But let's say you just win one soul per year, and then you teach that soul to do the same thing. So you disciple that person and you say, now you go do the same. Reach one soul for the kingdom of God. And they do that and then it starts multiplying. Now, how long until the whole world is reached? Well, you can do the math. After about, after the two years, of course, you have, um, after, yeah, after one year you have two souls. Then you have, you have four souls after two years. Then you have, uh, yeah, and, and the super evangelist here, he is just, taking off like nothing. But after 17 years, something starts to change. In year 18, you see things, you see this little curve is starting to exponentially grow because this is an exponential curve. And uh, the closer you get, how long until they actually reach the same amount of people? Uh, 23 years. That's where it cuts. 23 years. If we follow the discipleship method, they're still only the winning one soul per year, not not a hundred thousand, not uh, ten, not no one soul per year, and teaching that person to do the same. And now, of course, this is theory. But what happens after after twenty? It's a twenty-two years actually. Yeah, twenty-two years, I think. Twenty-three years. Then you have this. It just takes off. After thirty-two years, every single person is an Adventist in the whole world. So can this done, be done? You know, we looked at the, the dis discouraging statistics before, and we thought, oh, this is impossible. It's not impossible. With God, all things are possible. But if you just look at it, study this method, that every person, now imagine, this is if one person starts doing this. Then after 32 years, if he succeeds in doing that, the whole world would be reached. Now what if, what if 20 million people did that? <laughs> then how fast would Jesus return? Yeah, and so this is my encouragement to, to us. 
And a big hindrance um, is that we have have a wrong conception about what the pastor's role is. And that's why I want to talk about this in this course. You might say, well, I'm not a pastor or anything like that, but this is really important for every single um, church member. If you turn to Acts chapter 6, we see the key, or yeah, we'll study what the Bible actually says concerning the pastor's role. So Acts chapter 6, and um, verse 2 to 4. Yeah, actually, from verse 1, it says, Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Okay, so there was a complaint. There was conflict in the church. Now, who should come to the rescue? The pastor, right? Isn't that what we're, we're expecting? If there's conflict in the church, we call the pastor. The pastor comes in and starts to mediate between these people and, and works things out and, and rebukes those who need rebuke and and, uh, and comforts those who need comfort and so on. Well, that's not what they found here. Verse 2 says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, have, uh, whom, <clears throat> whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word and they accepted this and if you notice what happened in verse 7 it says then the word of god spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith so was this a good plan this was a very good plan instead of the pastor focusing the pastor's focusing on what um on the conflicts of the church they said no we have to leave this to other people and then we go and we reach souls. And we, we follow this discipleship method. We multiply disciples. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul says to Timothy, who was a pastor in, in one way, But you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. And then he says, Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. That is what a pastor is. He's supposed to do the work of an evangelist. Now, what's an evangelist? If you study Acts chapter, if you study the whole book of Acts, you see in Acts chapter 8, there is one person called Philip. He was actually one of the deacons here. And it's an interesting topic to study because he began as a deacon, but he ended up as Philip the evangelist. Isn't that true? He went from city to city and he baptized people. He, he, he raised up churches and so on, and then some other people came up and, and did follow-up work of what he was doing. But that's the work of an evangelist, to go out and reach unconverted souls. 1 Timothy 4 says the following. Yeah, you can read it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So you see this? Paul is again addressing Timothy and he's saying, give yourself entirely to these things. Uh, and what's he supposed to give himself to? To the reading, to the exhortation, to the doctrine, to the teaching of the Bible. That is what he's going to do. Teach the Bible to people. Um, and don't neglect the work. So, he, yeah, give yourself entirely up to this work, he says. And then you will save yourself and also those who hear you. So this is the, the idea. And of course, there is another role or another uh, job for the pastor found in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 and 12. Uh, yeah, does someone else have that one? 
and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, and including twelve. Yeah, up to twelve, yeah. Mm -hmm. Including twelve, sorry. For the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All right. I think you're reading from the King James, right? Yeah. And uh, I like the King James, uh, but there, in that verse, it has an error. And that error is a comma, a very devastating comma that should not be there. That's not in the original in any way. And most other uh, texts are um, translated in a different way. He's speaking about apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers, these leadership roles. And what, is, what are they to do? Well, they are to equip the saints, and then it comes to that comma, or the perfecting of the saints, and then it says comma. Uh, but it shouldn't be. It says, for the equipping of saints for the work of ministry. That is, they are to equip the saints to do the ministry. Does that, does that make sense? That's what this says. It doesn't say that, yeah, they should be equipping the saints, and then they should do the ministry. No, it's the members that should do the ministry, but they... The, the pastor is supposed to equip them to do that ministry. So if you, if you look at any other translation, it will it'll translate it uh, like that. So that is actually the pastor's job, to teach people how to work. Ellen White says there would be many that would start working if they were only taught how to begin. They need to, to learn how to win souls. And yeah, it's hard work sometimes, but it is a very, very blessed work. It is something that will inspire and enthuse the church so much that, they will, that the world will be able to be reached. So this is my definition of the pastor's job description. They are to do aggressive evangelistic work, plant new churches, and equip members for missionary work. That's, that's basically it. Um, now when we go to study the writings of um, the early pioneers, the early Adventist church, it was a huge success in the beginning. The Adventist church grew more rapidly than any other denomination uh, in, in, the, in the late 1800s. And um, there was a secret to this, and that was because they understood the role of the pastor from a biblical perspective. And Ellen White was given, I mean, she's, she's given, she says so much about this, and I don't understand why there are not more people that take this seriously, because this is, this is so profound. And it is really sad that we have been lost, we lose sight of this. Uh, testimonies page, testimony 7, page 18 says, God has not given his ministers the work of setting the churches right. No sooner is this work done, apparently, than it has to be done over again. Okay? It, it, she says it very clearly. God has not given his ministers the work of setting the churches right. Sometimes we think, oh, we need a good pastor that can really set the church right and sort out all the issues and, and, and teach these people how to, how to be spiritually well and so on. No, that's a mistake, Ellen White says. It's a, it's a devastating mistake. mistake. And that, because then as soon as he, as he has done that, he'll have to do it over again. What, what should happen instead? Church members that are thus looked after and labored for become what? Religious weaklings. That's what happens. They become religious weaklings. They, don't, uh, they depend upon the pastor instead of on Jesus. If nine-tenths, she says, of the effort that has been put forth for those who know the truth had been put forth for those who have never heard the truth, how much greater would have been the advancement made? God has withheld his blessings. But this is serious, you know. God has withheld his blessings because his people have not worked in harmony with his directions. So we are actually, by, by having a, a different attitude towards uh, the pastoral work and thinking that, yeah, they're supposed to fix the church and set the churches right, we're withholding the blessings of God and we're stalling the latter rain movement. This is quite serious things, but that's what she's saying. He goes on to say evangelism, page 59. There are those who think it is their duty to preach the truth, but they dare not venture from the shore, and they catch no fish. They will choose to go among the churches over and over the same ground. They report a good time, a pleasant visit, but we look in vain for the souls that are converted to the truth. 
through their, in, uh, through their instrumentality. These ministers hug the shore too closely. Let them launch out, that's the ekbalo, thrown out, be thrown out into the deep um, and cast their nets where the fish are. There is no lack of work to be done. There could be hundreds employed in the vineyard of the Lord where there is now one. Have you heard that there is a lack of pastors? And you know what that usually means when a, when a church member says that? They say, we don't have a pastor, right? Oh, our church doesn't have a pastor. I, I travel around in different churches and, and they, they envy other churches. Oh, that church has a pastor. They, they can do so much work. And, and they even say, you know, we don't even have a pastor. Stuff like this. You always hear it when people are talking about the deplorable situation of the church. And we need to educate more pastors so that they can come and, and help us in our work. This is not the purpose of the pastor. And we are totally wrong in our picture of what the pastor is supposed to do. Send them out where the fish are. Send them out into the unreached places. Evangelism 382. Our ministers should plan wisely as faithful stewards. They should feel that it is not their duty to hover over the churches already raised up. This is, this is the radical crazy, craziness of the Adventist church. And you know what? Why don't we send our tithes? You know, you know why the Adventist church sends their tithe to the conference or the, the union and not directly to the local church? The reason from the start is because of this. It is because, it, 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 yeah, it's not, it's not only that, you know, we, we need to balance so that a rich church has, you know, more money and so on. That, that's not the real reason. That is one reason, good reason, but it's not the real reason. The real reason is because there was no pastor, there was no settled pastor over the churches in the early times. But they were out planting in a, you know, where there was no church. And that's why, in order for the means to reach these people, they were sent to the conference so that the conference could send it away. So that, that, that's really the background of it. Um... They should feel that it is not their duty to hover over the churches already raised up, but that they should be doing aggressive evangelistic work, preaching the word and doing house-to-house -house work in places that have not yet heard the truth. This is what they're supposed to do. And, you know, I'd be curious to know, if, if I had a bigger crowd here, I, I would take uh, questions maybe to, like, what is your, what do you, what, what is the pastor's job? And I might, you know, you might hear different opinions. I've done that sometimes, and you know, people say that, yeah, it's to preach and to, to do, do these kinds of things, uh, to preach in the church every Sabbath and to take care of prayer meetings and to, well, this is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to do aggressive evangelistic work, go out to reach uh, people where they have not, um, that have not heard the truth, yes. Of the saints, we'll get, yeah. Uh, so, this is one element of kind of teaching and equipping church members to do yes. work. Uh, and then we have also mentioned this uh, uh, kind of part of it straightening up the church, um, meeting people where there's problems and you know, these things. So, um, so where I guess this equipping of the saints is somewhere in between, in a way. How would you, how you, like, how much? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Like, how much, where's, the, where's the balance with that? And I think uh, we'll, we'll get to that. I mean, if we just look at the ideal, it is that the, the pastors, they raise up a church, and then they equip the members of that church, and they go on to another church. And they, um, you know, maybe they come for a visit. If you think about Paul, what he was doing, he was a pastor. We think, oh, he was a super evangelist, church planter kind of thing, not a pastor. But that is what I think the pastor was supposed to do. You go to a church, plant it, you preach and, and you plant a church, you go move on to the next field, and then you come maybe and revisit it sometime and, and strengthen it and write letters and whatever to encourage it. Um, Ellen White says that if nine-tenths of the efforts had been put forth, you remember that quote? Yeah. 
uh, into the people that were unreached, then we'd have much better success. So maybe the balance is if you put one-tenth of equipping the saints and then you have nine-tenths in evangelistic work. Even though I think if you equip the saints well, then, that, then they can be part of the evangelistic work as well. Yeah, we praise the Lord for them. Because <laughs> it's a new thought, right? It's a radical idea, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. And the, the elders have a, a, a large role in, uh, in pastoring uh, the local uh, churches in one way, even though, yeah, they shouldn't be paid for that you know <laughs> that's uh, that's part of their um, and, and I guess that that's the difference because that's what the tithe was supposed to go to uh, in other con conferences I, I've heard um, in South American places they put 70% of the tithe into evangelism uh, in, in Sweden it's it's uh, 4% <laughs> you know it's like um, yeah no it, it, it's just different huh I, I forget where it was. There was an, another. I think it was in South America. So it was came out of an evangelistic effort. Yeah. In Mexico took their funds, sent 100 elders and pastors huh. into Honduras. Wow. To train and to hold evangelistic meetings in places where it never was. Wow. As the result of that. Right. I mean, that's how churches grow. You know, the church we belong to was once planted by someone. Someone went there and, and, and did this work. And that's why we're here. And then we think, yeah, this is how it always has been. We, you know, we get that feeling. And like, wh why doesn't things happen more? Well, because we've forgotten this main core of what it means to be Adventist. <laughs> to me, it's, it's, a, it's a core. Um, and, uh, interesting, if you study the, the early Adventist um, pioneers, here's James White in Review and Herald. He says this, In no way can a preacher so well prove himself as in entering new fields. If he, if he be successful in raising up churches and establishing them so that they bear good fruits, he gives to his brethren the best proofs that he is sent of the Lord. So this was actually something that pastors had to do in the early Adventist movement. They had to go out and plant some churches to, to prove that they they were actually sent by God. And then they could be entitled to tithe uh, support and, uh, and those kinds of things. But it was, it was a serious matter. Now, even he goes so far to, as to say in the next paragraph here, if they cannot raise up churches, then certainly the cause of truth has no need of them. And they have the best reasons for concluding that they made a sad mistake when they thought that God called them to teach the third angel's message. Ouch. Now that's pretty serious, but that was the attitude that the early Adventists had. If you are not part of, of planting a, uh, uh, or a, if you can't plant a church, that's what he's saying. You're mistaken, you're calling, sorry. Next one. Now, that's very radical. I don't know how, how to, impl I, don't, I don't think we could implement this in our church today, but you know, I hope that we can try to get the same mindset back into our churches if we go hope to finish the work. Now, Adventism grew amazingly in the, in the late 1800s and people, other churches were very curious. They were envying all the Adventists because they were, they were really reaching, they were planting new churches everywhere. And so at one point, A.G. Daniels, who was the conference president or yeah, general conference president at that time, he was interviewed, what's the secret to your success? And this is what he said. He says, we have not settled our ministers over churches as pastors to any large extent. In some of the very largest, large churches, we have elected pastors. But as a rule, we have held ourselves ready for field service, ev evangelistic work. And our brethren and sisters have held themselves ready to maintain their church services and carry forward their church work without settled pastors. And I hope... This will never cease to be the order of affairs in this denomination. Now, this is a sad, sad statement. 
For when we cease our forward movement, work, and begin to settle over our churches, to stay by them and to do their thinking and their praying and their work, that is to be done, then our churches will begin to weaken and to lose their life and spirit and become paralyzed and fossilized and our work will be on a retreat. Can you back up once more? Now, this is prophetic, you know. And sadly, that's what happened in the Adventist church. Why? Because the churches were calling for pastors. We need a pastor. We're dying. Our church is dying, you know. Ellen White said, Testimony 7, the greatest help that can be given our people is to teach them to work for God and to depend on Him, not on the ministers. Let them learn to work as Christ work, worked. Let them join His army of workers and do faithful service for Him. And then she says, and I, I'm just amazed to see this quote, but this is what, this is what she says. There are times when it is fitting for our ministers to give on the Sabbath in our churches short discourses full of the life and love of Christ. But the church members are not to expect a sermon every Sabbath. And we thought that, that, that was the, the whole point of the pastors, to preach sermons every Sabbath. And I says, no. Yeah, sometimes they can come and, and have a sermon, but this is not what they're supposed to expect. Instead, she, she encourages people to have testimony time and you know, people to, um, to share what God has done in their lives. Like That kind of, of thing should be the regular thing in an Adventist church. And the, the pastors, the preachers, the eloquent preachers, let them go out and do the, speak to those who don't know the truth. I mean, we know the truth already. We can read about it. We can, we can study it for ourselves and keep ourselves fed. We don't need to be spoon-fed by a pastor. We need to keep ourselves spiritually maintained. And yeah... I just don't know what to say about this, but this is so powerful to me when I realized this. If the proper instructions were given, if the proper methods were followed, every church member would do his work as a member of the body. He would do Christian missionary work. And then she says, but the churches are dying. This is what happened. And they want a minister to preach to them. Now, what should they done? What should be done? Should they send pastors then to preach to them? She says, they, the church members that ask for pastors should be taught to bring a faithful type to God, that he may strengthen and bless them. They should be brought into working order that the breath of God may come to them. They should be taught that unless they can stand alone without a minister, they need to be converted anew and baptized anew. They need to be born again. <laughs> I mean, these are, these are just earth-shattering quotes if you study this, but that is, you know... Yeah, get rebaptized. If you're not a missionary, you're a mission field. That's what she's saying. And that's what the Bible Jesus said it too, right? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If you're not fishing men, are you a follower of Christ? I don't, I, don't, I won't answer that. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And now I start to realize, hey, this is kind of the church version of what I have seen in the educational world, right? Right. Where this is true education. Yeah, you can unleash power in people by making them think and, and act and do uh, when God is their teacher in a way. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for... Yeah, thank you for that comment. That's, that's really true. Uh, this is another one. I mean, I could just read, read for you all, all evening here, but 
I want to read this one. Our ministers are not to spend their time laboring for those who have already accepted the truth. Uh, there's so many of these quotes. With Christ's love burning in their hearts, they are to go forth to win sinners to the Savior. Beside all waters, they are to sow the seeds of truth. Place after place is to be visited. Church after church is to be raised up. <clears throat> those who take their stand for the truth are to be organized into churches. That's the equipping of the saints. And then the minister is to pass on to other equally important fields. So that, that's the, the way that, that we were supposed to work. You plant the church, you equip the saints so that they can manage on their own. And you know, a, a baby church might need a pastor, right? Just like a, um, a baby will need a, their parents. But then you've got to teach the child to eat for itself, to dress themselves and to to do everything so that they can be independent. And that's the purpose of the pastor. Yeah, if you start a new church and, and you know, they come from very different backgrounds as, uh, as she was sharing here before, you know, you have to help them along a bit and teach them also. This is what it, it is about. But eventually, once they start to learn how to feed themselves, they start to learn how to pray for themselves and do all these things for themselves, then you can move on. You can say, well, now you can take care of this. See you, <laughs> pray for us. <laughs> and we go out to the next one, yeah. In the areas where we really have church growth, it's the elder who does that management. Yeah. But it has to be an elder who was in another church before. You know, who can transfer that knowledge and that confidence. Hmm. But he's not the pastor. No. no. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, elders are definitely included in that equipping the saints. Mm. And, um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand this one, that, that she's saying that they're to be visited, raised up, and then they are to move on to another field. Now, you know, Paul sometimes stayed longer in certain places, so it's not like a, you can't make a thing to say that you have to stay exactly six months and then you can move on. No, it's like sometimes you need to stay two years, maybe five years or something until the church is really equipped and then, but, but we need to have this mindset. I'm not stationary. Um, and you know, that's also in the Adventist church, we have this idea of rotating pastors. Now today it's just like, a, oh, all right, we need to rotate because he ran out of sermons or something like that. But that's just not the purpose of it. The idea was that, yeah, now this person has, been, uh, has established you, so now he's gonna move out. That was the idea, that was the mentality, and it's, it's, it's like a relic that is left from this time when we actually grew in a powerful way as a church. And I think many churches, they are doing this, and, and the places where they are, as you said, in Mexico and Honduras, and uh, yeah, the church is growing. But the places that is not, that we have adapted to the other churches that always have their own pastor, and they're preaching to them, and the, you know, it's just dying, spiritually parallel. Para Paralyzed. Look at this. Statistics. 1870s. There was one new church per 1.7 pastors employed every year. Uh, today, there's one new church per 123 pastors employed. Something has changed. And it is this mentality that uh, they, are, they are hovering over the churches. So, as, I'm, as I began to study this, and I realized that we got to do something. And this is what, what projected me into this idea of church planting. I felt like I can't just, yeah, I've been doing Bible work in other churches, but we need to move on. And um, I'll just share a little bit about this in, in closing. I know that maybe you have to go soon here, but... <laughs> yeah. But I'll save you up. That's okay. <clears throat> Number one, realize that every church plateaus if they are not involved in church planting. This is my first uh, point. We need to start thinking in church planting terms. We need to realize that the purpose of our church is not just to maintain status quo. We want to plant new ones. And that's why we are raising them up. And the, the churches that, do, that are involved in this, they will grow. They will flourish and, and uh, have an, an amazing impact. When I started this, I realized that, yeah, there's a church in Malmö, there's a church in Helsingborg, there's the church in Uspi, three in this big place. But there are huge areas that is just white. 
There's no Adventist presence. Ystad, Hörby, Eslöv, Lund, um, Sjöbo, uh, Kristianstad, all these places. Växjö is up north, farther, far, farther up. This is just Skåne, the, the southern part of, of Sweden. And we felt like, well, Lund is like the academic center of, um, um, and it's, clo- it's close enough to Malmö to do it, but it's, it's still far enough for the people in Lund not to travel to Malmö to go to a church. So we realized that this is, this is where we will focus. Also, there was a youth group there, that international youth group that, Uh, gathered there uh, every um, week, basically, in Lund. And some of them, they never came to the Malmö church because it was too far and you had to have, it was too expensive and so on. So we started doing that. We had an, uh, a guy employed from Uganda, his name is Daniel Sekatawa, and we started working together. We did some evangelistic series, we did health expos, and we had some results. We started having Bible studies. I was working full-time, well, not full-time, I was studying 25%, I was working 75% in Malmö at that time, and then one day a week I gave to Lund. So I couldn't really put my whole heart into it, but this burden started growing. He was, he was a Bible worker for half a year in Lund, and um, we started getting results. We even had a baptism of, of some people that we studied with up there, and then we realized that we need to do more. Uh, Daniel, this guy here, he had to leave for Uganda because of some um, immigration, um, the immigration uh, situation and um, he, would, he wasn't granted a visa basically. So he, he was sent back unfortunately and uh, the church started to, to pray. They started to pray and say, Lord, we need to find some replacement. There is a work that has been started there and who's going to take over? Now, I was still working, being stuck here in, in, uh, in Malmö, and I was, but I was preaching to them. Um, actually, the first sermon I preached in Malmö, when I came back there now, was I said, you know, I'm not going to be here all the time. And I even told them I would plant a church, in, in, I would be involved in, in church planting in, in Lund at that time. And so, they, they of course didn't believe me, in, in, like, that's, but things started to change. Uh, after there was this work here, and the whole church started to pray for this. So every Sabbath after the service, uh, people gathered from the church and they prayed, Lord, um, send labors, uh, like, the, like the prayer we read, right? Throw out labors there. And they, we prayed for this for, for almost half a year, and uh, things started to change. God put the burden on these people's hearts. Now, these people... You've seen some of them here already. They're very active. And they're very active in the Malmö church as well. Actually, they were kind of the core of the Malmö church in, in uh, some ways. And so God put a burden on these people that, yeah, we want to be involved in this. We, we see light in this church plant. And so at one time, we told the whole church, uh, the church um, business meeting that, you know, God has answered our prayers. Here are the people that are willing to go out and plant a church in Lund. And you know, <laughs> what was the reaction you think? <laughs> um, of course they were happy <laughs> about the evangelism, but they, and they've been praying about this all the time, but, but they actually didn't think God would answer their prayers. <laughs> and they said that even, they said, yeah, well, yeah, well, I know we prayed about it, but, 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 but you can't be going. What's going to happen? Everything's going to implode. The Malmö church is going to crash. I mean, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Who's going to be the elder? Who's going to be... It's not going to work. You can't do this. I mean, we have to close the church in in Malmö. And and there was all these doomsday prophecies. Um, Bobby was there, the the president. And and he tried to calm their fears and say that, no, we will still keep an eye out for you. And, you know, we had a plan. So we did an exit strategy. We we worked on um, finding in mentoring new leaders in that church. We found people and, and, and prepared them for this. And when the nominating committee asked for this, they, they were ready. They accepted it. No problem. <laughs> sure. Definitely. We'll keep in touch. Thank you. So, 
that's the thing. Pick the most active members for your core team. That's, don't pick the, the ones that all oh, these people don't really like the church. You know, sometimes there are disgruntled members. They're like, oh, nothing is happening in this church. I, I want to go to another church. Um, those are not the, the ones you want to have in your church plant because they will be just as disgruntled with the new church as they are with the old church. So you find those people that are really active, that are working hard in the local church. And you say, these are the people we need. And then the other members that are disgruntled, when they realize that, oh, all of a sudden, there's a huge need for my help. So instead of sitting warming the pew, I will have to go up and I'll have to actually do something. The Mama Church today is amazing. All, many members that were never doing anything because there was always someone better to do it, all of a sudden they've stepped up. They said, no, we need to do something about this. We need to pull our acts together and that church is thriving and it is growing. So it is healthy for that church and it is healthy for starting a new church. I don't think any church has ever died because of church planting. <laughs> I have yet to hear about that. So we were elected as part of this team to go out. They sent us out. Um, we had a commission service. And we started uh, spending time in this building uh, on Saturdays in Lund. And we developed some values. <coughs> and um, the other thing is we, we wanted to involve every member in mission work, all the way from the start, we wanted to set it up as with this mindset that, yeah, we, we want to start a new church. Lund wants to start a new church. Yeah, we just started, but we want to think about <clears throat> soon we might leave and, and go somewhere else and do it. And we need to train every member to be an active part already from the start. So, yeah, we started, uh, you just see some pictures here of the things that we're, we're doing when we're gathering there have Bible study, we have worship services, and we eat together every Sabbath. Um, number four, my last point here, is to adopt a strategic evangelistic plan. And that's also very important. You can't just start a church by taking some members from the old church and putting them in the new church and think that's your church plant. Uh, Simon Martin, my mentor, he would call that a transplant, not a church plant. <laughs> And that is detrimental. If you're going to start a church, you need to do evangelistic work. You need to have a very clear focus of what you're going to do. You're not just there because, oh, we like a little club better than the club over there. No. If you're going, you need to have a clear evangelistic plan. You need to go out there and make a plan. We, we made our plan that we call the evangelistic uh, spiral. Now, this is in Swedish. I'm sorry about that. But um, it's the... Uh, it's a, I won't go into all of this, but anyway, we, we, we made a very important plan where we have health expo surveys, distribution of flyers, cooking demonstrations, choir, exercise uh, programs, mini series, concerts, all of these three levels. We want to create contact um, and we want to gain, build confidence and also to invite them to follow Christ. All of those three elements. You can't do only one or only the other. You have to do all of it at the same time. And that's the idea of it. And also equipping classes, equipping the members that have been baptized. You want to continue to reach uh, them as well. And this is, of course, built on the famous quote of Christ's method alone will bring to true success. And the Savior mingled with people as one who decide their good. He ministered to their needs and won, and, and won their confidence. And then he bade them follow me. So what we did was we started a health club in order to meet people's needs. And this health club, uh, first we did a survey it's on the street. We used the mission app, as you can see, he's using it here, the beta version. Uh, this is this fall. We went out and we started to do uh, surveys to see, well, we're starting a, a health club. What things are you interested in? And then we have a big list of things that we might be doing. And we see what people are interested in. Would you be interested to have information if we started? Yes, they say. We fill out their information. We build a contact interest. We, just from one hour going out on the streets, we had, we had 20 contacts. And it's, it's amazing. It's so simple. People are interested, especially in health. Um, Sorry. Uh, yeah. This mission app can also collect data in terms of questionnaire and Yes, because it, I, it I can. Use just briefly, and it's mainly show your location, etc. 
in the pla uh, plant a seed, uh, stuff, stuff like that? Yeah, if there's a resource tab. And on the resource tab, that's where the surveys are. And the, it is not developed perfectly yet, but um, in the future, we will be able, you'll be able to make your own resource and uh, your own surveys. And that you can't, you can't do right now. Yeah, and, and then you just use that one when you go out. Uh, and it plants a seed every time you submit a, a survey. We did that now in the outreach. Uh, we had one of those surveys. But here we, we're also, you can also do paper surveys, and that's what we did here because we hadn't developed that so far yet. But still, just we had 42 people we talked to, 42 um, contacts, 20, 20 contacts, and the three people that were interested in Bible studies just from that one hour. Wow. We follow up on those things. You have to follow up immediately. You can't wait a week or two. You have to call them the, day, the next day and say, hi, do you remember we, we met you on the street uh, and um, I see that you were interested in Bible studies. Would, uh, when would be a good time for you to, to meet up? And that's the way we do it. And yeah, another thing we did, we did, we'd have a lot of sport activities also in this health club. We go for hikes, we go for climbing and uh, had a health expo. Uh, where we, uh, I can tell you stories about this, we, we, we spread 10,000 flyers out into the community and the place was flocked. We had, in three days, we had only two hours open every day. We had 151 visitors come and uh, we had uh, 77 contacts after that and 10 Bible study contacts. We called them up right away and I booked Bible studies with about eight people of those right away. We, we started to study just the next day. It, it, was, it was the best experience I've ever had with a health expos. Because usually I've been waiting for, you know, wow, that was a lot to do a health expo. Now I have to wait a week, week to recover and then I call them and then they're not interested anymore. So these are just some ideas. But here you see the interest forms, what people are interested in after doing our surveys. Um, and that's, that's how we work. <coughs> Uh, vegetarian Christmas dinner. It's a very popular, you know, julbord, uh, we call it in Swedish. It's a Christmas, Christmas dinner. huh? A banquet. a banquet, yeah, that's a better word, I guess. Um, it's, um, so it's a cooking class specific for Christmas? And no, that's the cooking class, but the, the dinner is the banquet. So you, you prepare all the food and you invite people. Yeah, and then they just they pay money and they come and eat. It's been hugely popular in Malmo. We've had it like every year for um, I don't know, 14 years. No, it's, it's like a long time. Um, and um, um, we have we have hundreds of people coming. Even the you know political leaders are, are joining that <laughs> Christmas dinner, and it's all vegetarian food there. So it's it's quite a powerful way to have a natural contact with people. But of course, it's not enough just to have that. We want to lead them on to other things. So every time in the, in the Christmas dinner we announce, we also have these programs. And if you're interested, take a flyer and everybody gets a flyer. And some people come to the follow-up things. And then we also invite them to spiritual meetings. And some people are interested in that. So people, instead of being with their family, or maybe without their family, they come to this banquet? Oh, they, they come with their family, usually. Okay. Yeah. And they pay... Uh, they, they pay like 300, 400 kroners <laughs> to eat this yeah. per, meal. per meal. And uh, they know that this body will go, you advertise a special charity? Or yeah, we do that too. So everything goes to ADRA, what ah, we're doing. Okay, yeah. so you specify, okay, this money goes to ADRA. Yeah. You will have uh, healthy food, the money goes to charity. Yeah. These are the activities that ADRA will do. Yeah. And... Uh, what yeah. else? You, how it is during the banquet? There will be music or there will be music. Message? Not not so much a message. There will be pamphlets about Adra's work, and then in the middle of it, we, we also have an announcement to share a little bit about the Adventist Church. You know that this we're into health a lot and tell a little history, and um, that's why we're having a vegetarian. Uh, thing and and all you know that all your money that you paid here goes towards the work of Adra and you tell a little bit about that and that's it. So it's um, it's we don't want to be very invasive because usually 
people want to have their own thing, but at least something. They, they understand why we're doing it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, spiritual lectures, people are interested in that. Uh, Bible studies, you see, we had 18 contacts, and I'm studying the Bible personally every week with about uh, 10 to 12 people every week, just from this false uh, work, uh, and that is all to the glory of God, you know. It's, it's amazing to see how God has, has blessed uh, the health ministries. We, we use the health ministry as the right hand, and, and people, we, 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 tr we also try to lead them to Christ through that. Um, cooking classes, my wife's making some food, and it's interesting, one of these people, this guy here, he came to a cooking class and we invited him to uh, an exercise program af the day after, um, or not the day after, no, the, a few days after, and that was the Sunday that, um, that he was invited to. It, quite early in the morning, we would go to a, a park there and we would run together. And he biked 40 minutes in uh, minus degrees just to get there. And uh, we, we went exercising, we went running. And you see he's sitting here also uh, eating breakfast with us afterwards. He just craves this uh, community uh, that, that we, we've created. And, and that's our idea, basically. We want to create a community um, that we would do ourselves, you know. We, we want to, we, these are the activities we like. So we do those activities and then we invite people to join us in that. So if you have a burden for, I don't know, bird watching or whatever it is, you, you do that. But just do what, what you like and, and then you invite people to join, but you also have an evangelistic um, edge to it. That, that's really important that you see the big strategy. How does this connect to evangelism? How can this lead to Bible studies and baptisms? And it, that doesn't mean you sit and ask every person that comes <laughs> if they want ba Bible studies, but you give them a chance in, in different ways and you, you win, after you win their confidence, they're open to this. So, uh, he also came to a climbing thing that we had, a uh, climbing event. So, and then we have mini-series, which is kind of evangelistic series with, um, that are short. Um, and it's not harvesting campaigns but it is a very effective way to find Bible study contacts. This last series that we had, we had only three meetings, one, uh, three Saturdays in a row. And from those, we had, uh, sat, no, it, it was actually the, the, the service. At 12 o'clock, we invited people. We only distributed 2,000 flyers because we were short on time and we got them late, so we, we did very little impact. Usually you get one person to a meeting for every thousand flyers you distribute. And uh, so we were expecting two people. Well, we, we, got, we got nine people coming. And uh, that was, I mean, the first time we had four, the second time we had zero. Then we prayed very much, especially one woman prayed, uh, she fasted for this. And, and the, the, the one after we had five, um, five visitors. And among those, two of them wanted Bible studies. So we started Bible studies right away um, with, with several of them after. But I've never had a mini-series where we have not had Bible study contacts as a result. And because here, spiritual seekers are coming to these things. This one is about the hunt for truth. Is there a God? Why the Bible? Is God good? Um, so, yeah, I was presenting that here, as you can see. And then we had a meal together with those who were interested. And you rent the location? <clears throat> we rent a place right now. We're looking for, to buy a, a venue, and the union is very positive towards that. But... Uh, we haven't found a good place yet. Uh, so during just this fall, we've had 116 contacts, 16 Bible studies and, and, and one baptism. So we just praise God for, for the work he's doing there. And uh, I hope this can inspire you guys to also take uh, some of these principles to your own church. Um, the ideas about church planting and that it actually works. People are hungering. We just need to find good methods that, um, that can help. Uh, this is our strategic goal um, for 2023. We want to have a thousand contacts, 200 Bible studies, and 17 baptisms, which is quite a uh, 70 baptisms, which is quite a high goal. But you know, you don't reach as high as the, the or you can't reach higher than the goals that you set. So we and set the bar high. This is for Lund. 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 Yeah, that's what we are aiming for. Uh, 
ratio between just contact and Bible study. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, but that, that, yeah, that's what basically what we had, 10% here. Well, yeah. not, it's actually more it's than 10%. Good. It's very good. Yeah. And uh, how the Bible study are uh, progressing? I mean, uh, how drop out, uh, <coughs> Yeah, so, some of them, uh, actually so far we haven't had any dropouts, but usually you have to count on some dropouts. Um, some of these, uh, of course, they signed up for Bible studies, but then they were not interested when you called them. Even if you called them the day after, they were like, oh, I thought it was something else. Um, some of them I, I study with, is uh, they're Muslims. <laughs> um, some of them, one of them, there was a, a Catholic couple that they... Um, they speak only Arabic. They're, they're learning Swedish, but they, it's like very difficult for them. They don't Catholic. speak any English, huh? Catholic, you said. Yeah, they're Catholic from, from uh, Syria. Uh, they had to flee when the war started there. Um, and they wanted Bible studies. So I started to study the Bible with them, but I can't speak to them. I can't communicate with them. <laughs> so God gave me this idea that uh, order Bible studies from it is written in Arabic. So I did that. Uh, had Arabic Bible studies, they read it to themselves, to the whole group. I just sit there and I, I flip on my English uh, phone, uh, I mean the same study in English, and then maybe I tell them some text to, to read and we do some sign language and, you know, the Lord is blessing. <laughs> I, I did that with some people in Malmö in, um, that we spoke um, Farsi and uh, we had, we had uh, four baptisms as a result of, of that, uh, just studying um, through this way. So I believe that, you know, we can be creative where, where there's hindrances. Uh, God can work out um, certain things. So, yeah, this is the vision. We want to start a church plant, campus ministry, and even a center of influence as well. And uh, we're starting small. I guess that's the, the ideal. Uh, I can tell you very many stories of... Um, what we've been doing, but I, my time is up here, so... <laughs>